Start investing in gold and silver at sdbullion.com today and join over 35,000 precious metals investors who have made the switch to the lowest gold and silver prices in the industry. SD Bullion recently claimed a spot on the prestigious Inc. 500, making them one of the fastest growing bullion companies in the United States. With low bullion prices and over-the-top customer service, SD Bullion is setting the standard for precious metals transactions. Visit www.sdbullion.com today. Start saving on every precious metals purchase you make. Hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with the SD Weekly Metals and Markets Wrap. I'm filling in for the doc today, and with us today is also Eric Dubin. Eric Dubin, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, it's great to be here. All right, well, I think the first topic we're going to discuss is about the precious metal markets in the new year. Um, we've seen precious metals go up a little bit. Did you want to discuss uh, a little bit about the price action we've seen in the past week, um, this first week of the new year, and where you see both gold and silver heading for the rest of the year? Well, it's no surprise to see, you know, the first couple of days of the trading year, see a lot of action in the metals and people coming into the metals. We had a pretty decent down day on December 30th. And then uh, within the turn of the year, you have institutional uh, players who are trying to get uh, portfolio readjustments for the start of the year. Uh, a lot of people are doing tax loss selling in December and a little bit in November. Um, the whole expectations of rising interest rates going really, really fast and, and you know, the Fed talking up uh, the prospects of their their dot curve, you know, their, their or dot plot, I should say, their forward-looking assessment of, you know, the summary of what all the um, economists and policymakers that make the voting decisions in the Fed are looking towards in their forward-looking view. I mean, they, they basically scared the market a lot and the expectations of rapidly rising interest rates and then rising dollar um, commensurate with that will um, put a lot of pressure on precious metals throughout the whole period uh, since the election. And it was interesting, you know, December 30th, we saw this really big town move where the dollar index, the DXY, fell to 101 handle. And now we're, you know, we're retracing a bit of that. Uh, so, you know, we, we have a lot of trends where precious metals have been very volatile since the election, and then all of a sudden people are moving back into the sector, and we've seen that in the start of the year, and all of those trends are pretty much what we'd expect to see. We've seen that same pattern last year as well. I'd expect January to see a lot of volatility, but that overall the month will be a positive as well as uh, all of 2017, uh, precisely because of just this growing um, understanding that inflation pressures will combine with stagflation where our economy is still reeling, but you know the addition of whatever fiscal spending that they're able to get through Congress and other governments, that's going to also help push up inflation pressures as well and expectations for higher interest rates and all of that, which is what we've seen uh, since the election. And those trends are going to continue in 2017. I know I just interviewed uh, Bill Murphy from the Gold Antitrust Action Committee, and he was saying that He's expecting new highs for gold and silver in 2017. He's especially bullish on silver. He said once silver breaks through $21, it it's we're going to see kind of like a move like we saw in 2011 right up to $50, and it could even go farther. So what is your perspective on possibly new highs for gold and silver in 2017? I don't know if it'll hit in 2017. I mean, it's a high probability that it'll be, you know, 18 months pretty darn easily. <laughs> And then trying to nail down exact forecasts like that is really a tough, uh, tough game. But the reality is, is that we've been in this really long consolidation. Then we had a really big move. You know, we had a bear market cycle that began uh, a couple years back, about four and a half years back for for gold. And then we had a really nice three quarters of 2016. But most people are the assumption that the gold and silver markets are still in a longer term bear cycle. And that's a good thing that sentiment is that negative, even after we had the big move in metals last year. I, I, you know, we have a really strange scenario and situation in our world where we have a banking system, particularly in Europe, that has insolvency issues that are huge that ultimately impact even the entire economy. I mean, French exposure, the banking system in France is so exposed to Italian bank you know, bonds and government sovereign bonds in Italy, that anything that goes wrong in Italy could easily 
take down a euro by a chain reaction. Um, it would take time, of course. It's not something that would happen overnight. But those kind of underlying deflationary flywheels, you know, this potential energy for something that can just kind of spin out of control is one side of the coin. And then the other side of the coin is what we were talking about earlier in the show, where we have this rising expectation for inflation creeping in. And so it, it's it's we have a confluence of contradictory forces. But ultimately, in the long run, either of those forces are actually positive for gold. And a lot of people don't even understand this because they look at uh, rising interest rates as something that will always invariably be a negative for precious metals. And that's simply not the case historically. You know, usually it takes a while for interest rates that are rising to um, be correlated with rising precious metals. And then really, most of the time, it's boi it boils down to the real rate of inflation actually um, accelerating faster than what is nominal rates. Um, so ultimately, in 2017, we're going to see a lot higher precious metals prices. And I kind of suspect that we won't take out the old highs. Uh, but within 18 months, I would think that that's probably going to happen. I was wondering if we could discuss also a little bit about the stock market, because since the beginning of the year, the stock market has gone up a little bit. The Dow is, for the last probably month, it's been kind of trying to go above 20,000, and it hasn't gotten there yet. It's about, right now, about 40 points away from uh, 20,000, and we started the year around 19,900, a little below that. but. Where do you expect the stock market heading? Because I know I was just talking with Bill Murphy yesterday, and he was saying it could probably go either way. Some people are expecting it to crash, but you know, with kind of inflationary pressures, it could just keep rising. So where, what is your perspective on where the stock market is headed? I think we're actually going to see a little bit of both, believe it or not. We're going to see a market that pulses. We're, well, we have, since the November 8th election results, added uh, roughly 2,000 points on the Dow. And a lot of that enthusiasm was based on uh, the economic assumptions that the Trump infrastructure spend was going to boost the economic activity and raise corporate profits and lots and lots of talk about a strong dollar and, you know, um, all the various tax cuts and, and the reductions to regulations and the economic swath of policies that have been hinted by the Trump administration got people very excited throughout November and all the way to where we're now trying to, you know, bash up against the 20,000 mark. The problem is, is that rising interest rates are not good for the stock market, and a rising dollar is horrible for multinational U.S. corporations' profit bottom line. And incidentally, uh, that actually is going to be a catalyst. Uh, I can already see with data that's coming out that uh, U.S. multinationals will, in fact, be reporting some uh, hampered earnings because of the rise in the dollar. And I've been saying for six plus months that policymakers would be rather concerned once the dollar would rise in a level that would be reflected by, say, for example, the, the DXY index at 105. So, you know, I think we are staring down the very high probability, particularly given the duration of this move since the 2009 March low of where we've been in kind of like, in the grand scheme of things, pretty much suspended animation in, in the broader U.S. stock market for the last couple of years with just total artificial support, a weak economy, uh, a huge amount of buybacks by corporations and their treasuries that were buying their own stock because they were able to get credit for next to nothing and turn around and then buy their own stock. I mean, we've had over a trillion dollars worth of that activity directly by corporations buying their own stock. The, the market is so supported by all of the efforts that were holding up the bond market, which is, in essence, the greatest manipulation in, in economic history. And we have all of these illusions of markets that are healthy and people thinking that the economy is stronger than it really is. And I think the you know, things are going to start falling apart, and the catalyst that's going to cause enormous pain is going to be rising interest rates. And even though we've had a little bit of an intermission, and the 10-year has pulled back a little bit since mid-December, it's calmed down a little bit, 
And even though the dollar hasn't uh, shot up a lot, and yesterday actually looks looked a bit like uh, the dollar was even guided downward, there's been a lot of crazy action within the currency markets in particular. The FX market has been insane this last couple of months, and it's going to get even weirder as we go forward in 2017. So ultimately, I think first quarter, no later than in the second by the second quarter, we're going to see something like maybe 15% correction on the S&P 500. Uh, and then, you know, policymakers tend to respond to things like that. How many times have we seen a 10 some odd percent correction in the S&P 500 in the last couple of years where as soon as it gets around 10%, the plunge protection team comes in and catches the market, buys equities, futures. We'll, we'll see those kind of activities. We'll probably see as well more talk of stimulus and uh, uh, the Fed will definitely be backing off of their um, discussion about the, the forward guidance of being aggressive as they have been. And in fact, um, to some extent, even yesterday and pricing through the markets in, the, in this week, after the FOMC meeting minutes were released and they were all talking about uh, assumptions about the campaign pledges that Trump had made in his latter um, month or so on the campaign trail about the fiscal infrastructure spend and all that. Uh, it, they're making assumptions even in that meeting that was reported in minutes this week that have been a moving target and are now even backpedaling. I mean, Trump was talking about a trillion dollar plus infrastructure spend. Now it's reported 550 billion and so the markets are just trying to process what everything is going on with the Fed. And the bottom line is that the Fed and all of the economists there don't know what they're doing either. They, they kind of play by, uh, by the, the wind and by ear and, and, and figure out as things go. And, and I have talked about that in, in documented analytical terms. If you look at their uh, range for their forecasts, their you know, 70% confidence interval that they sometimes speak about, Janet Yellen, talked about that uh, back at the last Jackson Hole meeting. You know, you could drive a Mack truck through the range of where the Fed actually has in terms of the debate internally about where the economy is going. So they really, they're like chickens with their heads cut off. They honestly don't have a, a clear sense of what's going on, and they're more reactive, and they always have been. The Fed is not the and the Fed is not an institution that leads, it follows, and markets are ultimately going to start leading the market. The markets are ultimately going to start leading where policymakers are going to respond, and they're going to be res responding from a position of surprise because of the fact that confidence in central bankers' ability to juggle all of these balls in the air that they've been doing reasonably well for all of these years since the 2008 crash it's just going to fall apart because debt has grown enormously and then the solvency issues in the banking system remain, particularly in Europe. We have a huge mess on our hands and they basically policymakers try to borrow forward demand from the future by using lots and lots of stimulus. And that doesn't fix anything. No, I mean, that just makes people poorer. <laughs> And that helps stagflation, too. That's another reason why we're going to have stagflation, because of the distortions in the economy and how you know, people are a lot poorer now. The standard of living for the average middle-class American, as by one example, has declined by some 35% in the last 15 years. No, you were talking about how the Fed is reactive and it, <laughs> they don't know what they're doing right now. Um, I find it kind of interesting also that the Fed is so secretive. I mean, if you look back at the foundation of the Federal Reserve, if you've, you know, read uh, G. Edward Griffin's book on the, uh, you know, the creature from Jekyll Island, a second look at the Federal Reserve, it's really, it really has sketchy beginnings of how they, how all these bankers and uh, politicians met on this private island to kind of formulate plans for the Federal Reserve. And um, kind of throughout its history, it's interesting how the Fed really hasn't been fully audited on monetary policy. And um, so they're not only it may seem like they're being super reactive right now, but they're really secretive with what they're doing. And, you know, Rand Paul has many times uh, wanted to audit the Federal Reserve on monetary policy. And now uh, Rand Congressman Rand Paul and Congressman Thomas Massey are working together and reintroducing an audit the Fed bill. Now, 
and it seems like there's actually maybe more hope for it this time. This has been tried multiple times, but the reason there might be more hope this time is we have a Republican Congress. Both the, the House and Senate have a Republican majority, and uh, President elect Trump has also been very critical of the Fed and thought an audit would be a good idea. So what is your perspective on the prospects for actually getting a full audit done? Oh, well, a full audit done, um, probably very slim probability of that ever happening. Uh, it's kind of like how reform efforts and through legislative processes or what have you end up getting watered down in their implementation and bureaucracies are very good at defending their own turf. Now, you know, I'm not just speaking about the Fed as an, as an institution in and of itself, but, you know, the auditors and so forth. It, it's going to be a challenge, even if the bill succeeds in getting all the way to the president's signature. Um, but the beauty of at least making this a political effort, and in fact, this was the rationale behind Ron Paul's original idea for trying to audit the Fed, it isn't so much the desire to know every single bean that's being counted and where anything may be hidden, but in fact the very process of actually shining some sunlight towards that creature and getting people to see some, maybe not all, but at least some of the crazy things that they have been doing and the, you know, the, the, just the excesses that the Fed has been engaged with. In uh, the immediate years after the 2008 crash, the Fed was involved with a giant amount of currency swaps behind the scenes that they never reported. And in the process of the audit the Fed movement, which has been going on for years now, the uh, Fed was dragged into court by Bloomberg News to get uh, documents and information about what they've been doing with swaps and it was also tied to the pressure that was in Congress and the public being aware of the audit the Fed bill. I think it was in 2010 when this was going on. So this has been uh, a, a, in an annual process. Uh, Rand Paul introduces the legislation each year. He's been doing it every year. And even though it hasn't passed, the process in and of itself is worthwhile. And a lot of people within the precious metals community get really skeptical and just cynical about the value of the whole effort of trying to audit the Fed. But the reality is is that politi political culture responds to public awareness, even if most people are completely oblivious to the nature of what money is and <laughs> all of the understanding of our monetary system being as it is, such that Mark Dice can't even pawn off a you know 10-ounce bar of silver instead of a Hershey's bar for chocolate. <laughs> The reality is, is that most Americans know that something just isn't right. And when, you know, the Fed was revealed to have done $16.1 trillion worth of swaps with the ECB and other banks in order to directly input money, currency, into European banking systems, that raised a few eyebrows. So those are the kind of things that make average Americans think, well, wait a minute, are these – institutions actually acting in our best interests. I mean, they may think that Fed, the Fed is, you know, a federal uh, organization and that it's not a you know, largely private institution. And they may be completely unaware of those kind of things, but they're aware that their standard of living and their incomes are falling. By the way, when I said 35 some odd percent before, they mean their standard of living. I meant incomes, you know, average wages and stuff. Um, so the prospects for the audit the Fed bill are reasonable this year. I think we might have something that's ultimately watered down in order to get it passed. Um, those are the kind of horse trading machinations that happen in Congress when they're trying to push through legislation. But you're right. There definitely is enough interest and support for it to maybe see it pass this year, and that would be wonderful. Uh, it's not going to be the be-all and end-all to save things or fix things, but at least it shines some sunlight in the direction of this vampire creature that has no accountability for the most part, even though they, they claim that, that what they do in terms of their reporting and public statements and the, you know, the interest that they'll pay on treasuries and all that stuff um, is out in the open, when in fact they do an enormous amount of market activities um, subterranean and, and never reported, ever.
you know, and I remember the, the, the great uh, quote from Alan Blender, who, or Blinder, excuse me, who was the vice chair of, of the Federal Reserve a couple of decades back, and he was you know, amusingly quoted as saying that the last duty of a central banker is to tell the public the truth, and isn't that the truth? The last topic I thought we could discuss today was the um, kind of, you know, it's been in the news for a while about fake news, quote unquote, fake news and Russian hacking during the election. And today now Trump is actually going to get a briefing on this Russian hacking. And it's I think it'll be really interesting to see, you know, maybe what he says afterwards, because he's been really critical of um, and skeptical that there has been this Russian hacking or that it influenced the election at all or anything like that. So. What is your perspective on this notion that's kind of in the mainstream media that the Russians tried to influence the election and so on? Um, I know Silver Doctors and um, also your your website has been labeled as echoing Russian propaganda or you know fake news and stuff like that. So <laughs> what is your perspective on this whole situation and now that Trump is actually going to get a briefing on it? Yeah, well... Um... It was the Washington Post that put out that uh, prop or not, the propaganda or not. And they have this website, propornot.com. It's a shadowy outfit, and <laughs> it, it, it basically has not revealed any of the reasons or uh, data that they have for the conclusions that they put out. And then, you know, the Washington Post was the tip of the spear that a couple weeks back uh, listed 200 plus websites, Silver Doctors, News Doctors, Investment Research Dynamics, Dave's Kranzler site. Zero Hedge. Ron Paul's uh, website, Paul Craig Ron Roberts. Paul, <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. This is that was, this is just ridiculous. BlueRockwell.com, um, Alex Jones. I mean, it's on and on and on. It's just uh, a, a very major swath of alternative media. And the rump of this whole uh, email kerfuffle uh, really picked up steam back in the June time frame when Someone leaked to WikiLeaks uh, a lot of email. I think that um, tranche of email had something like uh, 17 or 20,000 emails in it. And amongst them was a whole heck of a lot of email that basically proved that the Democratic National Committee, the organizing arm that basically you know, sets up and controls the machinations of the Democratic Party, and and how the party is run when it comes to its internal um, you, know, you know ways of dealing with things like setting up rules for primaries and 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 so forth. They did as much as they could to stymie the prospects for Bernie Sanders to win, and it gravely impacted his campaign. And and those emails prove it. And the Democratic National Committee and pretty much everyone within the establishment has never denied the content of those emails. There has been an attempt to claim that a Russian hacker or hackers working in within the Russian security establishment were in fact responsible for those email leaks and the Podesta, the campaign manager for Hillary, those leaks. There is no concrete evidence that meets the muster of security industry experts like John McAfee, who... Uh, just today has a really wonderful um, interview that he did with RT, one of those fake news services <laughs> that's being carried by Zero Hedge, and Tyler did a great article on that. I'd recommend that our listeners go and check that out if they're perusing the web over the weekend. The reality is, is that you know, even the FBI revealed yesterday before Congress that the Democratic National Committee refused the FBI access to the servers that were supposedly hacked. Now, if somebody breaks into your house and the police show up to investigate, are you going to tell the police to go away? <laughs> this is just the craziest story. It, my, my opinion, and I can't prove this, but I think that the majority of these hacked emails are basically a combination of three things that they're probably within they're probably sourced by people within the united states intelligence community frankly who were truly upset with the way things were going combined with someone within the dnc and we had that suspicious uh, murder over the summer and then you know just generic snooping all nations of substance united states 
Russia, China, UK, Germany, they all poke around in databases and infiltrate, and, and those the activities happen all the time. There's a huge difference between that kind of thing and then actually taking emails and, and getting them into the hands of WikiLeaks for an express purpose of trying to change an election and blaming that on the Russians. And to date, even though the intelligence community has made a lot of noise, the case that they've made is really just um, pointing to things that don't actually prove with 100% certainty or even a high level of confidence that it indeed was uh, Russians who were attacking. So the the whole um, weak tenor of this case is beginning to unravel. Even the New York Times has backpedaled and said that it was a third party as opposed to outright claiming that it was absolutely the Russians who were the primary source for these, these leaks. Trump has a vested interest in this, too, because basically the subtext of his entire presidency can be undermined by a constant public relations campaign from the left to claim that he is an illegitimate president, that he got in because of all of this fake news stuff and the, the dupes who were you know, trying to spread what are considered to be, quote unquote, fake news or conspiracy interpretations of what was going on. And we also have the problem of ongoing censorship. The mainstream media is getting their butts kicked. You know, the alternative media is now setting the tone and tenor for all of news. And even the mainstream media is falling around the alternative media like it's being led by the, by the nose. So they're fighting back. They're seeing their audiences shrink. They're uh, seeing their establishment credibility crash. The latest Gallup polls has uh, mainstream media at the lowest level of confidence in, in history of polling in the United States. So, you know, that that's a part of what's going on here, too. Um, people are becoming more aware of what's going on simply because they're not tuning into the control mechanisms of mainstream media. And there's actually, on balance, more people are thinking for themselves and getting their news from the Internet getting their news from places like the news doctors. <laughs> and that's why the media and the establishment have joined hands to try to fight back. And we have a problem on our hands. Censorship is something that can be achieved where a lot of people don't even recognize it happening. I mean, we've even seen it hit uh, YouTube revenues with a lot of uh, alternative websites that we know, alternative media producers, even Silver Doctors. When Google and YouTube and Facebook and Twitter – all manipulate the way um, you know, subscribers to a YouTube channel, for example, or even just Google searches serve up information to people that can reduce the amount of information flow. And that's exactly what's already happening. We've seen a huge change. So this is real. Uh, it's real censorship, even if it doesn't get to the point where they're you know, going after individual websites and trying to shut things down. They just systemically change the nature of the way information flows. And people need to be aware that that campaign is part of um, what this whole uh, you know, noise level is about. It's another effort to just raise expectations that you have to be afraid of getting information from anything other than mainstream media. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Eric Dubin. Um, I guess before we let you go, um, just to let our viewers know, uh, the doc will be here next week. He's currently on vacation, but um, he'll be here next week to give us an update on the demand uh, in the physical precious metal markets, at least what SD Bullion has been sh seeing. And also, uh, as, as you know, the metals and markets. And also next week on Wednesday, I will be doing a midweek update. Um, you'll see that on the YouTube channel as well. And before we let you go, Eric Dubin, is there anything else uh, you'd like to add? Well, it's going to be a very volatile year, and people should just uh, you know, buckle up because uh, we have been in, uh, in a suspended animation with basically the biggest bubble in the bond and credit markets of all time, and that is going to unravel. It's already starting to unravel, and it's going to change everything. And stocks are elevated with very high valuations, and we have an illusion for an economy. And things are going to start falling apart in 2017. It's going to be a wild year. All right. Well, for everyone listening, this has been the SD 
weekly Metals and Markets Wrap with Elijah Johnson and Eric Dubin. Thank you for listening.